thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so for those of you out in video land, we've been, uh, we've been fighting some tech support. So we're gonna wing part of it, but that's okay, because uh, that's what, uh, that's what our, our process is. Uh, when life throws walls in front of us. See, you like that metaphor, I put that wall thing in there. I'm gonna keep doing that the whole time. Okay, so uh, I, I do have to thank my sponsor. We gotta move on, because I've taken up a lot of time with the tech support issues, but uh, Schoolism is sponsoring me where you can find my, my online classes. Okay, so my friends, I am painfully aware of the same thing that all of you are painfully aware of, which is a whole lot of people wanna be an artist and they take classes, they study, and we all know that a very tiny percentage of those people actually become professional artists. It's pretty painful to watch. I mean, uh, very few make it through that battlefield. They go out there unprepared, and they die, and they die a hard death. That cannot be us. We, we, we talked about that earlier before the camera started. We're not kidding around. We are going to do anything that it takes to reach that goal anything it takes to smash that wall. So here's the thing that I warned you about before the, the camera fired up. So please give me a second and uh, we won't smash that wall. Uh, you wing it? Thank you, I, I think we'll wing it from here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll be good. <laughs> good, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the thing that I want you to give me, uh, it was gonna be a minute to explain it, now it's gonna be 30 seconds because we're low on time. Don't run through the doors until you let me explain. We need to talk about diet and exercise and you're thinking, oh dear, oh my gosh. So I didn't know exactly what this workshop was gonna be about and now some guy's gonna tell me that if only I run 10 miles a day, go on an all raw vegetable diet, I'll find the inner artistic strength to become an artist. Those might be wonderful things to do, but I don't do any of them, never have, and probably never will. What I wanna do is just use that as a metaphor for you because uh, the things that make us strong are actually the daily habits, the difficult daily habits that are hard to hold on to, and yet we have to keep those habits in place or we'll never develop the strength, you know, whether it's physical or uh, otherwise to smash through that wall. So I promise. I am not going to tell you what to eat. I want to use it as a metaphor. So my sad story starts back at DreamWorks Animation and um, uh, it was extraordinary to start on the Prince of Egypt, 1996. I was working pretty good, 26 years old, my first feature, uh, my first animated feature. Uh, if I did look good, it didn't last and here's why. All of you know about the free DreamWorks lunch, right? They had to close down the cafeteria for COVID. Everyone quit, but they're coming back now. <laughs> Uh, so it was, they said, you know, we got to bring people that are experienced. We're a new studio, so we, we need experienced people to come in and do this. How can we entice them? Food. Uh, it was a beautiful continental breakfast spread every morning. I promise this will be relevant. Uh, it was uh, the lunch, uh, the lunch, a full salad line, a full sandwich line, a full hot food line, a full dessert line every freaking day. And I gained weight. I looked in the mirror one day and I said, oh my gosh, this is embarrassing, son. You've got to do something. So I decided, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm a determined person. I'm going to go out every morning, going to get up a little bit early. I'm going to get some exercise. You've got to start slow. You know, you can't run a marathon. I'm just going to spend 20 minutes running around, you know, the neighborhood, running around the block. Got up, did it, hated every second of it. Uh, your body's not used to it, of course. Uh, so I got up the next day, determined, did it again, hated it even worse. Let me ask you guys, so this thing that I hated so much, how long do you think it lasted? Because uh, it didn't last. Uh, what are you gonna give me? Let's just see uh, who you guys are. Uh, did I just quit after the two days? Did I last two weeks? Did I last two months? Who's gonna say two days and that was it? Yeah, thank you, the cynics. Uh, the rest of you need to tell the truth. How many think I lasted two weeks until I gave up? Uh, maybe most of you. Who's gonna give me the full two months? I'm determined, guys. I'm a determined person. Thank you for the, your support. You're right, two weeks. <laughs> Things that we hate, you know, uh, something came up. Um, I had to be to work early one day. You know, I had a great excuse. We, uh, there's always a good excuse. We don't give up. None of us do. None of you guys do. We don't give up, uh, but things get in the way and they're good reasons and they're good excuses. So if something came up, had to be to work early, good excuse. And so I didn't do it that day and I never did it again. But 
diet and exercise, there's the diet component. So I said, okay, I'm going to go through that salad line, and really I'll get a couple other things a little bit, but I'm going to go through that salad line. Is that fried chicken over there in the hot food line? Nope, nope, can't do it. Can't eat that stuff anymore. So I did that, you know, and then um, I didn't tell you this. I was going on and on about all the DreamWorks food. I'm going to keep doing that uh, to my detriment. Uh, every day at the beginning, and they did this for a long time, every day at 3 o'clock, they would put out hot, fresh-baked dessert and coffee. And so, you know, the same day the fried chicken, and then a uh, buddy would come up and say, hey, did you go get dessert? It's like this extraordinary, like this flourless chocolate cake. Oh, wait, you're on that diet. Never mind, you can't have that. <laughs> well, it, it's idiotic because when you can't have something, it makes you want it 100 times more. So how long are you guys going to give me on this one? Two days, two weeks, two months, uh, two days. Who gives me two days and then I quit? Yeah, you, you, you know. How many are going to give me two months toughing it out until I quit? Anyone going to give me two months? OK. Justin, my friend, <laughs> thank you. Um, two days. <laughs> two days, and then the weekend came around. I got a really bad headache. The cure for a headache is comfort food. My idea of comfort food is in and out. So I drove straight to In-N-Out, and uh, you got to do, if you're from out of town, get a double-double animal style. It's heaven on earth. And those fries are looking a little bit plain, so here's what you actually need to do. Some of you are looking at that and saying, ah, what is that? Animal style fries. You cannot have a more spiritual experience with a French <laughs> fry than this. So you go to In-N-Out, get the animal burger and the animal fries, and uh, it's heaven on earth. So I did that, headache cured. And uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna stop eating things I enjoy for things I don't enjoy, it's just not gonna work. So, and yet, a short time later, I lost nearly 20 pounds in two months. Easiest thing, I know I'm sounding like this is a diet and exercise lecture, it's still not, I promise. Uh, two months, 20 pounds, it just happened, non-issue, easiest thing I've ever done in my life. And all of you are like, forget the art stuff, <laughs> how did that work out? <laughs> so one day, uh, you know, I was having trouble sleeping. I thought, okay, I'm just gonna go for a walk around the neighborhood. It's like 10 o'clock at night, this time of year. It was Halloween, decorations up. I was listening, I was talking to you guys before the video started about the sci-fi that we love. I had this sci-fi audio book I was wanting to get to. So I put that on, walked around the neighborhood, did not run, lived over here in the hills of Glendale, Walked up to the top of the hill, back down about a mile. I felt fantastic. The audio book was great. I wanted to find out what was going to happen next. I walked the whole loop again and loved it even more. So I looked forward to doing it the next day. And so I did it because I loved it. And I was looking forward to doing it the next day. And you couldn't stop me. You couldn't get in my way. You know, I would force you out of the way to do my walk. I loved it. So two days, two months, two years, two decades, I still do this nearly ever, almost every day, like almost never miss a day in the last two decades. There's the exercise component. I like a good salad, but not just a salad. You know, if there's a burger or some fried chicken, uh, what I decided to do, I don't have the willpower to last a week, but I do have the willpower to last one meal. So I started eating two meals a day instead of three. And that actually felt pretty good. I actually worked better at night. I felt a little lighter on my feet. So I actually enjoyed that. I'd eat the food that I liked, but then fast for that one meal, and boom, two months, the weight was off. And so the difference was, this is obvious to everyone, but it should have been obvious to me, and it applies to what we have to do. So it worked because it was enjoyable, rewarding, and convenient. Right there in front of me, no excuses. And so it became a lifelong habit that was very effective. So you guys have had the same experience that I've had. Go into your studio space. You're trying to learn. You give yourself assignments. But because you're in the learning curve, you don't know what the solutions are. And it does not go well. And you start to dread going in your studio. At least I did. So if you guys like anything that I've done, well, when I was coming up, I got to a point where I dreaded the studio, my home studio, so much, I could hardly bring myself to even walk into it. It was that bad. So I said, this is a, I'm, the goal is to be an artist. I cannot allow this to happen. So what I had to do was start with this. So I got my studio together. 
And uh, I found the carpenter that made animation desks for Disney. I hired him to make me a custom desk. I got all my stuff perfect right there, no excuses. You have a favorite desk, uh, you have a favorite brush, let's say, it's gonna fall down, it's gonna roll under a bookshelf, and then your favorite brush is gone. You have to have three of that brush, not one, not two, but three, because two of them are gonna roll under the bookshelf, and you'll be like, oh, I guess I can't do that painting after all. I'm gonna go see if there's some cake you know, in the fridge, and you wander off and never make it back in the studio. No, it has to be so convenient, no excuses, nothing gets in your way. So that's what I did. Everything I could think of, this is back in the early 90s. I used the Masterson Stay Wet palette. We were working in acrylics back in those days. And so everything was right there in front of me. Side cabaret, all my supplies. I love watercolor. I could roll that bad boy open, start painting, spritz some water on that, start painting my watercolor, just like that. No impediment. The bottom, I've got all of my paints right there ready to go. I even had jugs of water right there next to me so I didn't have to get up to walk to the sink to get more water. I know myself. I'll wander off to the fridge, look for some fried chicken, and like, oh, maybe I'll just go for that walk instead and never get back in the studio. I even had a catheter so I didn't have to go to the bathroom. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I didn't go that far. Uh, my flat file's behind me. Okay. Uh, here's what I'm gonna, I need to do, here's what I'm doing this week, here's what I'm doing today, right there in front of me, no excuses. So I am set up to go, baby. And so now I've got everything. And then digital reared its ugly head, uh, which turned out to be an amazing thing back in the late 90s, this came around. So I reset up you know, for digital, make sure I was set up for that. So now I've got my armor, I've got my tools, I've got my weapons, so I'm prepared in that way but I'm still not prepared to go out into the big bad world. Um, I don't know everything that has to be done to make it through that gauntlet. So that's what I need a distinction on. So we have your artwork, we have the subject of your artwork, we've got the three components of how you present your subject. We've got the rendering, the color, the composition, and so this is the content and this is the form that you choose to present your subject in. And then we have emphasis, and emphasis is critical because unless you give your subject a special emphasis, your artwork will never be special. Let me say that again because it's so critical, okay? Your artwork will never be special until you give your subject a special emphasis. And you do that through how you do your rendering, how you choose to do your rendering, how you design your color and light to serve the subject, how you compose your picture. It's all on emphasis. And emphasis, of course, is the purpose. Uh, every image we do has a purpose, even if you're just throwing paint at a canvas to see if something interesting happens random. That was the purpose. So even the craziest thing has a purpose. So rendering. We've got to get this and this to do what we want it to do. Really hard to do, but people have done it. Uh, don't expect you to uh, paint the Mona Lisa, but this image has lasted a lifetime and uh, beyond because this was one of the very first renderings that got this level of nuance and this captivating quality. But we don't have to be Leonardo da Vinci. I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Diebenkorn, uh, very different goals, and yet he's got to know how to work that paint to do this. And so moving from rendering into color, what I started doing to get myself back in the studio, I had this book on the bookshelf. And uh, James Reynolds, it was really fantastic work. There was lots of subtleties in the color. And uh, I was, frankly, I was deeply upset that he was so much better at color than I was. So what I decided to do was, I was gonna do a little study of every single image in that book. Now I didn't have time to do stroke by stroke, so what I did were these little 20 minute studies, side by side rendering that would let us learn the practical application of paint and how those brush strokes look when we place them side by side. So I did this, I did a study of every single image in the book, and uh, things were sort of clicking, you know, and uh, I enjoyed this. I mean, the problems were already solved by James Reynolds. I just had to kind of mimic them and learn from them. So I was back in the studio at home, 
enjoyable, rewarding, convenient. I love doing those studies. I was learning so much. And so I did more Edgar Payne. Uh, I would freeze frame the TV back in those days, the DVDs, maybe even the VHS cassette. I mean, you can see Blade Runner in there. And so I'd do little studies from my favorite movies, just pause the TV. That worked out really well, get outside. And I was trying to teach myself landscape painting. So I got outside on the weekends. And I believe this is the very last image until we go black, my friends. And you can see it's already starting to glitch. And I don't know what happened to the, because I, uh, uh, on my laptop before we started, I, uh, before we plugged everything in, I went through these and they were all working perfectly. But I did that. I did the landscape painting. So let me go back. I don't know what'll be, not me, what'll be nice to look at. I'll just go back. Let's stick with enjoyable, rewarding, and convenient on there uh, while I talk you through some of these other ideas. So I did the landscape painting. I did my weekly life drawing. I was going to life drawing sessions three times a week, and I tried to never miss. Three times a week. You guys uh, are thinking, okay, he didn't have a family. He didn't have a life. This was my life. <laughs> I was going to be an artist at, uh, at all costs. Uh, happily married now with kids and still figuring out how to do the extra work, how to do the daily calisthenics, the artistic calisthenics, uh, that is. And so my daily studies were sketches from life, sketches from uh, masters, and sketches from imagination. And by doing quick studies every day based on those three things, I really just so much came in and, uh, and I was learning so much at a great pace. And so I was still in the studio uh, working and making that happen. So my uh, artistic muscles started looking a little bit better. And I was a little bit more prepared to smash through that wall. So at that time, I had a great job at, uh, I had already, my friends, I'd already gone through art school and still knew I had so much more to learn. I went to Art Center here in Pasadena. I did not slouch. I worked as hard as I could figure out how to work. And then I actually, it worked out. I got a great job in theme park show design. Still had so much to learn. So I would come home from this job and I was doing this. I was doing my walk. I was avoiding dinner. I was doing my studies at home. And I would come home from a long day of overtime. I didn't have it in me even to do my little 20 minute study. Sometimes it really is that bad. It's not an excuse, it's real. So what I would do, I said to myself, I know how I am. I know how this goes. If I don't do something, even though I am wiped out, the habit might start to slip away from me. So I would sit down at that desk with that stay wet palette, my water right there, even though mold's growing in it, it's there ready to go. And so flip open that palette and I would just pick three colors and white. And I would try and put those three colors together, mix colors with them, and try and put them down in a little frame, you know, 16 by 9, and try and just weave them together in an interesting way. Well, that was kind of interesting. I'd spend five minutes on that, 10 minutes at the most, go to bed. I was dead to the world. And so I would do those. Those work so well, I ended up doing those by the thousands. And if any of you, I, I don't want to put too much on myself, but here I am standing up in front of everybody. And so it's my job to be a good example. Uh, if any of you have ever looked at uh, any piece I've done and said, oh, there's some subtlety in the color. And I, I, I like that. I would like to learn that. That is where that came from. Sure, I knew some color theory. I'd gone through art school. I knew what I was doing to a degree. But going further beyond that and getting that subtlety it was the thousands of little three color blends that I put together because how do you get this different thing, this different thing, and this other different thing together in an interesting way? And that is incredibly difficult. Those paints add up to about 2.3 million color variations. And that's what you have sitting in front of you. No wonder we run for the door when it comes to the complexities of color. And so that little process taught me how to put color side by side in an interesting way. And then I was prepared because Paul was saying, who was just in here right before us, who I cracked the joke to him, oh, Paul, you were the warm up act for me. The student becomes the master. And he said, yeah, we'll see about that. Uh, and then we had all the tech trouble. And so we were joking uh, at the top about, uh, uh, about the curse. 
uh, Paul reviewed my portfolio uh, for DreamWorks for the Prince of Egypt. And part of that portfolio, I included some of my very best of studies, not copies, but uh, uh, images from my imagination. So I had these painterly paintings that were trying to have a structure at the same time, a good quality of color and light. And then I included some of my imaginative studies in there. And Paul loved the studies. They fit with how they were trying to uh, color script the Prince of Egypt. And so Paul pitched me to the rest of the people at DreamWorks on the Prince of Egypt. And Paul told me, I didn't know this at the time, Paul told me years later, he said, some of the people didn't want you, uh, not because of your portfolio, but because you had no experience in animation. It was true. But Paul thought for me, felt like the portfolio had something in it. And I got hired at DreamWorks. And I was at DreamWorks for 15 incredible, you know, we worked on all those shows, uh, you know, uh, Shrek and Puss in Boots and How to Train Your Dragon. It, How to Train Your Dragon fans in this group? Good, yes, yeah, okay. Good, yay, yeah, that's, thank you, thank you. When, when uh, uh, How to Train Your Dragon, let me look at the time here. Okay, all right. And uh, we'll just, we'll let this, we'll let that image roll. Because uh, we, we have about, uh, uh, we have about seven more minutes. And so that'll actually be, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, so I got hired at DreamWorks. Uh, How to Train Your Dragon was in production for seven years and went through three sets of directors. And it was a bro, uh, it, it was just a heartbreaking, bone crushing uh, production. So when it came out, I went to a regular theater with a bunch of friends and just, just you know, not, uh, we had the premiere already. And at the end, you know, there's that silent moment, like, okay, is the movie over, you know, before the credits jump? And I was like, oh, did they like it? And then the credits rolled and everyone cheered, like just the regular family, you know, movie, neighborhood movie theater. And I was, you cannot imagine, you know, the bliss after how the production had gone to get it to the finish line. I just wanted, like just now, I wanted to stand up and thank everyone for their support. You know, uh, it was a credible experience. Well, I would not have gotten into DreamWorks had I not had this daily habit that I would not let go of. And that's why I brought up the diet and exercise thing. You know, um, if I had let that misery stand going into the studio and dreading it and dreading it and then quitting, would have never happened. I wouldn't be here, you know, having the chance to meet all of you here at Lightbox. And so I'm gonna throw, uh, because the other subject, uh, the other subject we had uh, rendering, we got here into uh, ideas about color, and then the other one was composition. So I'm gonna leave you with, uh, with one story about, about composition. Uh, composition was the same for me, the same process, because I have had to find a way to take the complexities of composition and learn them. They're very hard. The principles are not hard, but getting them to work are hard because you all know uh, we're called on to create images that are filled with all kinds of crazy stuff. And how do you take all of those characters and the spaceships and the uh, uh, and, and then the, the clouds and then the sunset, but then we're on a sci-fi planet, so there's a different sun with a different light source, and it just is a mess. How do you take all of those different elements and get them to work together in complete concert. That's what my definition of composition is. How do you make that happen? And it's incredibly difficult. And yet remember, we said purpose. Purpose is the key, what you give emphasis to. So as you have your assignment, whether it's self-assigned or professional assignment, uh, and you know what the subject is, and now you have to design it to make it work, you have to make sure that every stroke that you put down serves that purpose and not let a single errant stroke happen. Just cannot be allowed because your images have to come at the audience like a rolling boom of thunder. I mean like this is a smash through the wall. Your images, people have to gasp. They have to shake in their seats at what you do. And it's those daily habits that build you up to that point. So uh, I've been at DreamWorks for a while and uh, See, what was I, was I working on Puss in Boots? Anyway, so Shrek 4 came around and uh, I was the very first artist to work on Shrek 4, Shrek Forever After. They put me down in the basement, they were preparing a hall uh, to put everyone in so we were all together. And, uh, and so they 
found a spot for me, threw me in there. The director was up in San Francisco doing something different. I was down here in Glendale. And so they threw a script at me, uh, uh, just a 10-page treatment. And they said, all right, you know, here's, here's what we have so far. Come up with something, sketch boy, you know, chop, chop, chop. And the director was nowhere to be found, and they just you know, forgot about me down there. Well, I'm like, OK, here I am all alone, and they're expecting to see something. What, what do you do? All this crazy stuff going on in the story. And so the other thing I've been doing, apart from color, if I couldn't bring myself to do my three color trick, you know, like I only have 10 minutes before I pass out, then I would get a black prismacolor, I draw a rectangle, and I would put some shapes together in an interesting way. I had a blast doing that. I have sketch, I was gonna show you, I was gonna show you like literally a page that had about 10,000 of these little doodles. And again, uh, some of them like that, some of them from imagination, some of them just doing little, you know, little prismacolor black, black and white from life, some from imagination, some from reference. And I had done those by the thousands. So how do you put a complex image together? Well, you know, you have to know the principles of composition. And that's why my sponsor, schoolism.com, head on over there uh, for, for more, because we have, we were supposed to have a 40 minute talk and now we have a, uh, a 20 minute talk uh, based on tech. But um, how do you do that? Well, I had figured that out in about 10,000 different situations. So when they threw this Shrek thing at me and it had some really complicated scenes in it, that's exactly what I did. I sat down with my little Moleskine sketchbook, a black Prismacolor pencil, and I sat down and I did some little rectangles and just started putting characters and shapes together, trees, and just working out. And for every 10 I did, about one of them had potential. I grabbed one that had a little kernel of an idea and I developed it a little bit in the sketch, no one's watching, put some, scanned it to Photoshop, put some color on it, no one's watching, doing my own thing. And then I start rendering and, and working out the rendering of it, blow it up to like 6,000 pixels across and render, add characters into it, have the big spanning trees. I can't show it to you because it's on the slide. It's one of our slides that isn't coming up and I did this very elaborate rendered painting filled with characters of these ogres, the ogre resistant encampment, if you've seen Shrek 4, out hiding in the forest, preparing for battle with the big epic trees coming up. Finally, the director came up, came back from San Francisco, and uh, he, 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 loved, uh, he loved the painting. It was the very first concept painting and environment painting and character painting for Shrek Forever After. And it succeeded because it had three things. It had rendering, it had color and light design, and it had composition design. And all of those things aimed towards a very specific story emphasis. And when it hit that mark, the director came in and said, you're, you're on the show, We're, we'll, we'll keep to you. <laughs> I didn't know that there was a chance I was gonna be off of the show. Okay, so, uh, you eat what you want to eat. You exercise the way you want to exercise. I don't care. But what I do care about is that you do something every single day without exception, without exception towards your goal of smashing through the wall and breaking into the business. So that's what I got, my friends. Thank you so much. It's, it was the best we could do under the circumstances, but thank you. And uh, regrettably, uh, that's, we're right on our mark. We don't have time for questions. So uh, I don't know, see you guys in line or over at Booth 100, you're welcome to keep by.